The second derivative of sine x is negative sine x, and the second derivative of cosine x is negative cosine x. Are there non-trig functions with the property that their second derivative is equal to negative of the function? Well, let's find out. The first observation is that you can find these combinations of sine and cosine that still have the property. For example, you can write down something like 2 times sine x plus 3 times cosine x. And if you take its second derivative, then because constants come out when you differentiate, you're going to get back minus 2 times sine x minus 3 times cosine x, which is not, nothing other than the negative of the function we started off with, 2 times sine x plus 3 times cosine x. In general, a constant multiple of sine x plus a constant multiple of cosine x is going to have the property that its second derivative is equal to negative of itself. So these are what are called linear combinations of sine and cosine. It's just math terminology in linear algebra. And our question is, are all functions that have the property that their second derivative is equal to negative of themselves equal to this one? And I'm going to show you a beautiful proof that's going to dive into the world of complex numbers that's going to make the answer to this question yes and no. So watch till the end to find out what I mean by that. And right now I'm just going to start off with the proof. And we're going to start off by assuming that we have a function which is equal to the negative of its second derivative and derive some properties of it. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is start off with the equation y double prime is equal to negative y. And we're going to construct two functions from y. Okay, so y is a hypothetical function we're starting off with. We're going to construct a function f of x which is going to equal to y minus i times y prime. So f of x is equal to y minus i times y prime. And g of x is going to equal to y plus i times y prime. Okay, so two functions f and g. And why am I constructing these? Here i is the square root of minus 1. But why am I constructing these functions? Well, let's differentiate and find out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to differentiate f and g. What happens if we differentiate f? If we differentiate f, we're going to get f prime of x is going to be the derivative of y minus i times y prime, right? So prime, so we're going to get y prime minus i times y double prime. But of course, our original function y, which we don't know yet, satisfies y double prime is minus y. We're trying to solve for it. We know that because of that, this is going to equal to y prime plus i times y. But y prime plus i times y, which we can also write out as i times y plus y prime, is actually i times f of x. Because f of x is y minus i times y prime. If you multiply that by i, i times y minus i times y prime, because i times minus y is plus 1, this equation is going to be true. So it is going to be i times f of x. That's super interesting. What does that mean if f prime of x is i times f of x? Now, I have a super popular video on my channel which shows that if you forget the i and you say f prime of x is f of x, then f has to be a constant multiple of e to the x. Those are the only functions equal to their own derivative. That proof is very elementary. Check it out after watching this video. But once you know that, it's a similar principle for the derivative equaling to i times the function. It actually turns out by the same argument in that video, and that's an exercise to check out, that actually we can conclude that f of x is equal to a constant c1 times e to the ix. And if you differentiate this by the chain rule, the i will come out, so f prime of x will be i times f of x. But in fact, it's true that any function with the property is going to have this, it's going to be equal to a constant multiple times e to the ix. Now we can actually do the same game with g. And I'm going to do it just to kind of show you how this works. So with g, and g is actually a very interesting function. It's quite related to f. It's not f exactly, but it's quite related to f. So let's do the same game with g. And I'm going to abbreviate the steps. I'm just going to show you g prime of x. If we do the same game with g, g prime of x is going to be y plus i y prime prime, which is now going to equal to y prime plus i times y double prime. And because y double prime is minus y, that's y prime minus i times y, which is actually going to be minus i times g of x, which is y plus i times y prime, which is going to be minus i times g of x. OK, so you can check that out. There's going to be minus i times g of x, because again, minus i times i is 1. And what's super cool about this is the same idea applies to say that g of x has to actually equal to a constant times e to the negative ix in this case. Okay, because we have g prime of x is negative i times g of x.
Again, that video will explain the reasoning for this. But now we're going to do some, something super cool. We know that this is going to equal to a constant times e to the ix. This is going to be a constant times e to the minus ix. Now, how do we solve for the original function? Well, we've got yy and we've got minus iy prime plus iy prime. So what happens if we add the two equations? These are simultaneous equations, okay? And our variables are y and y prime. We know the right-hand side. So what we can do is we can now write that therefore, if you add the two functions f and g, you're going to get 2 times y is equal to c1 e to the ix plus c2 e to the negative ix, which therefore means that y is going to equal to 1 half times c1 e to the ix plus c2 e to the negative ix. Now, wait a second. You may be asking, these are complex valued functions because e to the ix is a complex valued function. And in this property, when I say f and g are constant multiples of e to the ix, the constants can be complex numbers. So to answer our original question, what are the real valued functions that have the property that the second derivative is equal to negative of themselves, we'll have to dig slightly deeper. And this is where the beautiful theorem, Euler's theorem, comes into it. Now, before I go into that, this is partly, this answer is that these are all the functions that are equal to their negative of their second derivative that are valued in the complex numbers. Which of these complex functions are real valued? Well, what we do is we can expand out C1 and C2 as A plus A1 plus IB1. Okay, these are complex numbers. C2 is A2 plus IB2, okay? I'm not going to do the whole calculation, but I'll show you the idea using Euler's theorem, right? Using Euler's theorem that e to the ix is cos x plus i sine x. Okay, what we can do is we can write this as y is going to equal to half times. The half doesn't really matter because you can absorb it into c1 and c2. So maybe I'll just write this as half c1 and half c2. Get rid of the half and just say this is going to equal to a1 plus ib1 times cos x plus i sine x. And then a const plus a constant times e to the minus ix, which is cos x minus i sine x. So it's going to be a constant a2 plus ib2 times cos x minus i sine x. Now, again, you can multiply out these complex numbers and you can find its real part and imaginary part. And because you want to find the y for which they are real valued, you want the imaginary part to be zero. You just want to look at the real part. And the real part, what are you going to get if you expand this out? You're going to get a1 cos x minus b1 sine x, right? That's the real part of this, this first expression. And here for the real part, you're going to get a2 cos x minus b2 sine x. Okay, so in the end, it's going to be a linear combination of cos x and sin x. Okay, so those are going to be the real valued functions because those are going to be, um, we already saw that those have the property that their second derivative is negative of the function. And now any function which has this property, if it's real valued, has to be a constant times cos x plus a constant times sin x. So we can write this as maybe just k1 times cos x plus k2 times sin x, where k1 and k2 are real numbers. So that is the answer to the problem. And this is a, essentially what I've done is I've explained to you how to solve this differential equation and I've kept it elementary. Okay, so I've explained this is all self-contained. It's all watertight. So drop a comment down below what you think about this. And there's a higher level reasoning about why this is true. I'll just mention this is a beautiful theorem in linear algebra. What we say is the space of solutions to this differential equation, y double prime is minus y. All the functions which are equal to negative of their second derivative is two-dimensional and it is spanned by cos x and sin x. So in effect, cos x and sin x are essentially the only functions equal to negative of their second derivative. Any other function in that property is what we call a linear combination of these two. And because there are two parameters, we say this space is a two-dimensional vector space. It's a vector space because you can add any pair of these functions, just like you can add vectors and you can scale any of, this, any of these functions and you get another function with the same property. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you loved that video. Check out my video explaining why the only function equal to its own derivative is a constant times e to the x and try to understand how the same proof on version of that can be used to show that a function equal to a constant times its derivative or when its derivative is a constant times the function, it is e to the constant times x or multiple of that. Okay, so check that out. Drop a comment down below. I wish you all the best and I'll see you in the next video.